right, welcome to another installment of our weekly online Bible study. Uh, this time we have been going over, uh, we started last week talking a little bit about uh, the, the concept of idols in the Bible, the concept of idolatry, I guess is what, what you would call it. But uh, in talking about that, we spent some time last week in the book of Genesis at the beginning, kind of uh, the, the, not Genesis, Exodus, the Ten Commandments. Uh, how idolatry, love the Lord your God, was number one, and then have no other gods before him, no great craven, graven images, uh, an engraver that, that might make something like that. And so uh, we really talked about, though, you know, because a lot of times when, when, we, when it started off the concept, people are actually making an idol, putting it in their house, bowing down to it, worshiping it, using, treating it as God because of something they could see. In Ezekiel, we mentioned that a lot of times uh, he, he talked about idolatry of the heart. Their, their idolatry moved to their heart. And, and it's really about our priorities, about what we order uh, for our lives, about whether God is God. And you know, we've talked about that concept quite a bit on Sunday mornings because a lot of the Old Testament narratives and stories about individuals, at some point during the story, <clears throat> somebody had the idea, oh yeah, God is God. Oh yeah, the Lord is your God. The Lord is faithful. And that's what the first commandment, you know, the Lord your God is one, uh, worship him and no other. And so the idea is, do we keep God number one in our lives or do we make other things a priority in in terms of that we're, we're expecting to get from it uh, something that we should be getting from God? It's not to say there can't be other things in our lives, but to say priority is number one and God is that priority. And so it's about order. It's about priorities. It's about uh, what's important in our hearts. Not necessarily do we set up a, an image in our lives uh, and go after that, although that certainly can be the case. Uh, this week we pick up, we, we, we read last week a lot of the Old Testament passages. I want to jump forward because in many ways the New Testament talks about it in the same fervor that the Old Testament did. Uh, Paul, for example, uses the, the idea quite often. And again, I think he has switched to, even though he's talking about uh, physical things, he switched to an idolatry of the heart. And a lot of that comes out in um, Revelation chapter, I uh, Revelation, <laughs> the book of Romans chapter one. And so I wanted to give you one of the resources to show you what I'm looking through, because I'll be looking at a book a little bit and and, and going over some of the ideas uh, from that book as, as we present today. But uh, Tim Keller is a pastor and uh, also uh, an author. Here's the, the book, uh, and it's uh, something that he wrote about the book of Romans. This is just Romans chapters 1 through 7. I have the other book upstairs, uh, 8 through 16. Uh, because Romans talks a lot about idols, because the, the presentation of chapter 1 of Romans from Paul uh, contains the idea of idolatry, Tim Keller, at the end of his book, uh, included a really, really interesting and helpful uh, set of what might be our idols. We could talk about that some today, a whole list. Uh, he connects to Genesis chapter 3, the idolatry of Adam and Eve and the process. And so there's some really good things, but I want to start off really by, by just going where he started off, which is uh, uh, Romans chapter, keep saying Revelation, because they both start in R. So why not just say Revelation the whole time instead of Romans? Uh, but let's read in Romans chapter 1, and we're going to start reading around verse 16, and then we're going to go for a few verses from there. Uh, but Paul in Romans says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So Paul is talking about several concepts here, salvation, the gospel, uh, but he's also talking about righteousness, okay? So if we in the gospel are saved through Jesus Christ, to salvation by faith, which he mentions, we're saved to righteousness. We're saved to live in the way that Jesus or God would have us to live. Uh, so unrighteousness then is not following God. Living by righteousness is being saved by the gospels, doing those things. And it's not something we'll earn. That's not the point. The point is that if we follow God, we're going to try to do the things that God would, would want us to do. So he's connecting that whole idea to the gospel, to salvation from the very beginning. And let's re read the next couple of verses. He says, uh, then he talks about the wrath of God. So first the righteous live by faith. But then he said, the right, right, wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And he said, their unrighteousness, they're suppressing the truth. And the truth here is set up to be God. He said, what can be known about God is plain to them because he's shown it to them. 
So Paul is saying the righteous live by faith. There's ungodly and unrighteousness. And God is showcasing his wrath toward ungodliness and, and unrighteousness because they're obscuring him. They're obscuring truth. They're obscuring pointing people to righteousness. And so he's saying when people come up and they look and they see righteous over here and unrighteous over that, the unrighteous often obscures the righteous and, and where people can only see the unrighteous. And so he's trying to, to calm that out so that people can see him and see righteousness. And then so this idea of how do we see God? God in the Old Testament presented himself a very specific revelation in his word, very specific stories that, you know, Moses coming down from the mountain other times with the Ten Commandments and the prophets God has in human history stepped out in uh, revealing himself to us. Uh, at that point, you know, also through Jesus and through the Gospels. But that wasn't even it. Paul here uh, makes a broad claim that's really interesting, starting in the next verse. Verse 20 says, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. He says, so, so that because of the way that things have been made, the people who look at creation are without excuse because they ought to be able to see God in God's creation. And then he makes this claim for although they knew God, he's talking about people who God was revealed to them, they saw God, but they chose against him, right? Because they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. So here people see God, have a chance to follow God. Instead, see something else and say, no, no, you know what? I got a better idea. <laughs> I'm smarter than God. I'm going to go in this way. It talks about a big fools in their, in their own wisdom, they're fools. Uh, we'll see a little bit more about that in a minute. But they decide to go off and make their own gods. And, and Paul's saying, <laughs> the God of the creator here created, and you're going to go off and worship a, so, a, something you made by hand, an image, an idol, rather than the God of all creation, the God of all glory. And so for Paul, it doesn't make sense. For God, it doesn't make sense. And for us, it ought not make sense because we're, we're mixing our priorities. Instead of following God, our God is one. The Lord our God is one. You worship him, have no other. Uh, we put other people in the place of God so that instead of just saying, here's God and we're following him, but we have other stuff. No, this stuff takes over the role of being God. It takes over the one we trust in when we need to be trusting in God, the one we receive our affirmation from when we need to receive our affirmation from God. So verse 22, Paul kind of sums it up. He says, uh, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God. For images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And then we skip ahead to verse 25 because this kind of brings it all back in. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So here's the idea and here's the theology behind idolatry. God is for us everything we need. Well, when we go after other things to meet our needs, that's idolatry. When we when we are su supposed to be the, the beloved one of God and we don't feel beloved because somebody else doesn't love us, even though God does, right? So then we're, we're elevating other people. We're elevating other things to be God for us, okay? So we can't see God with our physical eyes. We want something to trust in. We trust in ourselves. We trust in our job. We trust in our 401k. We trust in all of these other things. And what God is saying, no, 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 no. You can have a 401k. You can have a bank account, but that's not your God. Materialism is not your God. Your family is not your God. Your relationship to young person is not your God. And so for all of these reasons, Paul says, wait a minute. We have the immortal, right? The living forever God of creation. Why would you exchange a relationship with that for something that was merely created? That's the essence of idolatry. So if you look at the next slide, uh, we're talking about Genesis chapter 3, which is the fall of Adam and Eve. In the fall of Adam and Eve, uh, what Tim Keller says is there's kind of a process to the slide <laughs> from God is our God to idolatry. And we put something else as our God. And it's really, really uh, nice. And it's kind of spelled out a little bit here. It's six, six uh, uh, steps to that. But for, for Adam and even for us, so often it starts off with pride. Instead of thinking of God higher than, than we are and we're fine serving God and we're, we're fine 
uh, submitting ourselves to God, there's something in all of us that will say we want to be God. And that's what the serpent approached Adam and Eve with. Uh, you can be as God. And so it was pride that began the whole story about do we eat the fruit, do we not eat the fruit? And the fruit wasn't the idol in such, such a way as, you know, that they replaced God, not with a, a, an apple or whatever fruit it happened to be, but with themselves trying to be God. And, and in doing so, they, they did a lot of things. Okay, so the next one was fear. And you see when God is calling out to them, Adam and Eve said, well, we were afraid, so we hid. Uh, so there's, you know, pride is usually followed by fear. Uh, you, you step out and, and then you're afraid. And what, what fear does is makes you question who to trust. The next one is lies, because what, what they said is, oh, well, God said this. And the serpent says, no, that's not true. You should believe this, right? And there's a lie there. In, in making something else an idol in your life, one of the big steps is you, you mistrust. Instead of trusting what God said, you begin to trust what somebody else says or what something else says or what your heart says, what your feelings say, instead of trusting God. So the lie is accompanied with, uh-oh, who do I trust? And that's based on fear. Fear kind of disrupts trust. And then the lie steps in and says, no, trust me instead. And you're like, oh, I don't know what to do. Okay, I'll trust you. So Adam and Eve, having been created by God, living in the garden, having a blessed life, said, oh, well, yeah, sure, serpent, why not? Let's go that way. Because, you know, tasty fruit and all. It wasn't really about the fruit. It was about the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. The next one on there was self-justification. And so once you've fallen uh, for something other than God and you realize that you, you have a need, okay, is it maybe sin and you need forgiveness, we could talk about it in, in those terms. A lot of people try to cover themselves up, right? And Adam and Eve did that physically speaking. We talked about a couple of weeks ago that God, through sacrifice, uh, clothed them in skins. That was after the fact that they had clothed themselves in the fig leaves. And so at this point, God had not clothed them, and they're trying their best to clothe themselves. And so they go out and they find some fig leaves, and they're trying to sew it together because they figured out they're naked. The sin uncovers a, a spiritual nakedness, a spiritual vulnerability uh, that we try to cover up. So self-justification is us trying to earn our way back into the good graces or us trying to make up for what we did wrong. Bible, by the way, is full of telling us, and Paul's at the top of that, that we can't do anything to make that up. Uh, only God can make that up for us. Uh, so then we have lusts. And, and what we mean by that is uh, the, the Bible says that um, it, God tells Eve from now on, you, your desire will be for your husband, that, that there are going to be um, desires that control us more so than, or desires that are hard to control for us, rather than us just being able to wake up and decide what we want and going in that direction, that there are going to be things that we want that are skewed, inappropriate, and very difficult to manage. And we find that to be the case. The more and more we move away from God and trust other things in God, more we want those things that are not good for us or that are skewed versions of what God wanted for us. And most of the sins out there are, are not negative in and of themselves. They're skewed versions of what God wants for us. And the next one is varied miseries. And you see Adam being told he's going to work for a living, uh, Eve and the misery of childbirth and all that. And so at the end of this long slide away from God and into idolatry, we have the fact that we're miserable. That Adam and Eve, who were walking and talking in fellowship with God, have now replaced God with themselves, and they found themselves to be wanting, naked, uh, not enough, and unable to fix their their dilemma. And so, where do we where do we go from there? What do we what do we do with that? Uh, there really is, and Tim Keller talks about this. There really is a bondage in that. Okay, when we when we follow, we, you know, the Bible says we're to serve God. Okay, so so in some way, God is our Lord. That's what He says. The Lord your God is one. Calling Him Lord means we serve Him. So deciding against God doesn't set us free. Okay, we're just picking a different master, and, and we're we're cruel masters of ourselves. If, if we were to decide our own fate, uh, we're not as kind to us or as merciful to us ourselves as God is towards us. We find that out. Neither are other people. Okay, we, we change our loyalties to other people or to, to things, materialism, all these other things. They're, they're, they're brutal lords over us. And so the, really serving God is the service that sets us free and everything else would just become more in bondage. But I want to talk a little bit about uh, the things that we follow in our hearts that are modern idolatries or modern idols. And, and what we get from Tim Keller in his book is he was nice enough just to list a bunch of them. And, and he's trying to get us to think through, and the Bible's trying to get us to think through, what is our dilemma? What is it that we want more than God? What have we placed in front of God? And then what we'll do uh, after this week, we'll, we'll kind of talk about these this week 
let them sink in because we need to own our idols and our idolatry. Is it next week we'll be talk, talking about, okay, examples of that in the Bible and then how to, you know, strategies for how to get God back as number one in our lives. So that's coming up next, but let's identify, and this is not all of the ones that, but, but he starts off with this idea of a, of a life lie. For Adam and Eve, it was, you know, uh, God told us one thing and the serpent says, no, you don't have to believe it that way. Why don't you believe this? It gives us a counter lie. All these idolatries are counter lies or life lies or, or can't, th things that we tell ourselves. So uh, he, he has us start off the sentence in the following way. Life uh, ha only has meaning or worth if I or if it, this particular thing happens. And it's a statement that we could make and then it showcases what our particular idol might be. And so this is the example. Life only has meaning if I have power and influence other people. Uh, there are a lot of people who don't have that problem. Uh, there are a lot of people, we might call them politicians, <laughs> we might call them people in our everyday lives who thrive on power that they have on other people, um, dictators. Uh, they, but there are individual dictators in people's lives who thrive on the power they have over other people. And uh, so that is, it's a, it's a, a power can be an extreme idol. And we'll talk about examples of that in the Bible. Um, really God is supposed to be the powerful one. And, and even in leadership, the, the leadership that the Bible suggests is servant leadership and shepherd leadership, which is not power exerted over people, uh, but uh, service. Jesus saying, I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Uh, and, and that's the big thing, right? And so power is, is an idol. Uh, you know, life has no meaning if I'm not loved and, and appreciated by others. Um, are loved and respected by others. And, and really for a lot of people, approval of other people comes at a high cost or lack of approval from other people. And, and what God is in, screaming in heaven, I love you, I approve of you, I created you. On the seventh day, I looked down and I said, on uh, the sixth day, I looked down and I said, man, I did a good job. God created things. I said, look, that is good. And yet if somebody doesn't give us a nod of approval that they like us, that they like whatever it is that we're wearing or doing or working or showing or driving or, or, or living or whatever, all of a sudden we're not of value. To say I'm not of value when God says I'm perfectly valuable, extraordinarily valuable, is to put more emphasis on that person's voice than God's. It's idolatry. It's idolatry. It's the idolatry of approval. Uh, how about this one? Uh, I, you know, life has no meaning if I don't have this kind of pleasurable experience or particular quality of life. If I have to downgrade my uh, quality of life, then life really has no meaning. It's really comfort idolatry. Um, Jesus didn't have a pillow on which to lay his head, <laughs> uh, but we think we ought to have or else life has no meaning. And so we, we chase convenience and, and, and comfort. And it's really not not helpful. Uh, how about this one? Unless I have a particular kind of look or body image, it can be an image idolatry. I need to be seen as this. And if I don't have that image of myself and other people don't have that image of me. So you look at Hollywood, okay? People have a certain image of people and then uh, they turn 40, turn 50. And all of a sudden that image fades because the wrinkles come in and the, the things that were uh, young and and and, and uh, in a particular order now are not, are becoming less so. And so in order to maintain that, you know, how many thousands of dollars are spent trying to regain that image? Even if you look at, I go through the magazine rack at the bookstore, uh, most of those pictures aren't people how they really look. I mean, there's a sense of airbrush there because people want to think of a certain image. And so they correct parts of themselves in editing software so that we don't see the blemishes. And there's really a lot of that, you know, maybe, maybe that's not your particular thing, but it's certainly a real thing. Uh, you know, unless I have mastery over my life or this area of, unless I'm in control of, and so control can be an idolatry. Uh, a lot of times in life we don't have control. And so if we want that and really God's in control, certainly that could be an idolatry. Um, you know, a lot of people don't feel comfortable unless somebody needs them. That's interesting. You know, it's not, um, you know, that, that uh, they have material things, but it's that they feel needed. And so there's a, a helpful, um, helping idolatry. I need to be helpful to people. Um, uh, you know, it could be a dependence. You know, I'm not, my life doesn't have meaning unless somebody's there to catch me when I fall. 
Uh, it could be independence. <laughs> it could be dependence or independence, depending on your problem, right? Is the dependence wrong? No. Are you searching for dependence from God? Yes. <laughs> That's what Adam and Eve were doing. Is independence wrong? No. Is independence at all costs when you should be dependent on God? Right? Okay. So so, so it, it depends on your situation. It depends on where you're putting that. Uh, unless I, you know, unless I don't have any problems and I can maintain stand up by myself, life that really has no meaning. Okay. Uh, some people, it's, you know, I need to be highly productive, getting a lot of work done. And so, you know, you see a lot of people who put their, their job, their work in front of God. And, and I don't mean, you know, you got everybody who works. It's not saying your work necessarily does, but a lot of people elevate that work to give them meaning. And so what you see is a lot of people, when they retire, they go through a, a, a problem. Well, who am I anymore? Well, you're still a child of the king. What do you mean, who am I anymore? Well, I'm not this particular. And, and they got a lot of their sense of worth out of that. I think in God loving us, God so loved the world, right? We, we love him back. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. We're supposed to find a sense of approval from God, not from other people, not from our work, not from anything else. Uh, well, it could be achievement, you know, unless I'm being recognized for my accomplishments, excelling. So it could be an achievement, idolatry, materialism. We'll talk about some of those uh, things in the Bible because that's one Jesus talked about quite a bit. You can't serve God in money. So in other words, one or the other is going to be your God and the other one can't. So if money is your God, God can't be your God. Okay. In that way, so it could be materialism. Some people, it's it, it, religion has become for them an idol. Look at Paul, look at uh, the Pharisees in the Bible. It wasn't right religion, it was their religion, okay? And so what you see is the Pharisees had made up their own set of rules within within Judaism. And and Paul said, man, I was all about that until one day I met Jesus and he knocked me off my donkey and sh shone a bright light in my eye and caused me to see. I actually caused him to be blind for a while and that helped him to see later, right? And so for, for Paul, it wasn't Jesus, was it his religion? Not, we're not talking about Christ as an idolatry, Christ is 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 the point. Um, but we're talking about, it could be denomination for some people, could be their idolatry. Uh, and so that's interesting for other people. It's irreligion and being free from that. I doubt you're watching my show if it's irreligion show, channel, uh, Bible study, whatever it is that we're doing here. Uh, it could be a, uh, one particular person. Some people could have an idol of one particular person. I'm fine if this person likes me. As soon as this person not, doesn't, I'm in trouble. And it's not people in general who doesn't care about everybody else, but one person's got a hold of their lives one person. Uh, what about a few of these others? Uh, you know, for some people, it's their culture. Uh, they need to feel superior in some way. Well, Jesus created all cultures. So if you think yours is better than the other ones he created, <laughs> maybe you're putting your culture over God. Uh, belonging, you know, I need to feel like I fit into this certain group. And if I don't fit into this certain group, my life has no meaning. Family. Family could be your idol. A lot of people treat family and, and, and expect from family and give to family the praise and worship that they, they should give God. And what, what we're going to do, I believe next week, maybe maybe the week after, but I believe next week, so we're going to see two back-to-back -back images of one where a family where the kids and the family was the, wasn't the idol and one where they were. And it's going to be really interesting. And, and that might step on some people's uh, toes there a little bit. Uh, relationship, you know, could be a Mr. Right or Mrs. Right. And then for some people, uh, ide ideology, you know, it might be their politics need to be right or in order and then things are right. And if they, <laughs> every other four years are really upset. And I'm not saying I'm not upset, but I'm saying it's not my God, you know, uh, politics or, or ideology. And then the last one's pretty interesting because some people treat suffering uh, and, and martyrdom as uh, idolatry. And they need to be a martyr of a certain cause. They always need a certain cause. And uh, the worse they're doing, the better they feel about themselves. And that could be idolatry. We need to rather wake up and be happy. You know, I want to ask some people, no, 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 that we can't do that. This is going on. It's okay. I read a, a church sign the other day that said, God gave us a to today to prepare for tomorrow. And I could not more uh, disagree. Uh, God said he came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. I believe gave, God gave us life to enjoy him and our lives and our family and everything else today. Yeah, tomorrow's coming. Yeah, do some preparation, but it's not today is not for tomorrow. Today is for today. And today is also to enjoy our God. If we're doing other things, if we're, you know, then, then we, we showcase that we're in bondage to the things around us and not uh, serving delightfully the God who created us, the immortal God of all glory and wonder. So what are the things, you know, I'm going to put in just a minute, a list of the things, some of the things we mentioned, I didn't write them all down, but 
uh, some of the idols as a study question. You know, I just encourage you to pause it when that slide comes and look at that list and say, hey, which one am I suffering with? <laughs> What's my big one? Right? Which one am I most tempted to uh, say is my personal idolatry? And then uh, begin to think about what God might do in your life if he sets you free from the control of that or your worship of that or prioritizing of that over God. I hope that you're having a good day. Uh, this has been a, a quite jam-packed uh, little uh, <laughs> few minutes of Bible study today. And I tell you, we're not going to leave it here as a study, but today we're going to leave it here and let you kind of soak in that for the next week. Uh, what is your what is your idolatry? What do you struggle with? And then we'll pick up with some uh, ways of countering that in the weeks to come. So I hope you're doing well. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Until then, God bless you.